We're continuing our discussion here about uh, collecting data. And in this lesson, we want to take a look at what are called sampling techniques. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the various techniques for choosing a sample, um, know their advantages and disadvantages, and recognize the technique that has been used in a given scenario. The big thing you want to be able to do, though, is select a sampling technique that is appropriate to the population that you're trying to study and the goals of your uh, investigation or your survey. Okay. So first off, what do we mean by sampling techniques? Well, sampling techniques are the various ways that you can choose a sample to measure, uh, that, that you're going to measure from your population. Remember that the population is all of the things that you are investigating and from this population you're choosing a sample which is what you are actually going to measure. Okay. And from our lesson, uh, a couple of lessons ago, we said that the sample should be large enough to yield accurate results and be representative of the population under study. And these two points um, sort of influence each other. The more representative your sample is, the smaller it can be. Okay, if your, if your sample is less representative of the population, then you need a much bigger sample in order to get better results. Now, before we get into individual sampling techniques, um, the first word we should define here is census. Census is, means that what you actually do is you don't choose a sample. You actually survey all of the members of the population. Okay. So, this is uh, by far the most accurate way of getting information about your population. It's also extremely time consuming and um, it really isn't practical in most cases. But the only sort of institutions that can carry out a census tend to be when you're dealing with large populations are, are governments who send out uh, census forms to their entire population every few years. If you have a very, very small population under study, you could conduct a census. So for instance, in this class, if I wanted to know um, whether you guys wanted to have a lesson on Monday or not, I could ask every single one of you your opinion on the matter, okay? And that would give me an uh, extremely accurate picture of what you guys wanted, okay? So it's really only used for people who have a lot of resources at their disposal or are dealing with very, very small populations which is not most of the cases. So most of the cases you are going to be picking a sample and using it to represent your population. So the first way of choosing your sample is what is called simple random sampling. And this is where you just take a subset of the population and um, every member of the population is equally likely to be picked to participate in the, to be a part of the sample. So uh, as an illustration, we've got uh, some guy over here. I don't know, what should we call him? call him Bob maybe. So Bob wants to conduct a, a, a survey here and what he is doing is he's taken a bunch of colored balls and he's thrown them into a hat and he's got numbers on them so he's assigned numbers to the people that he wants to survey. He's just going to pull these numbers out of the hat and if your number comes out you're going to be part of the survey. Okay. And then after he's written them down he's going to toss them back in so that um, the, the probability doesn't change from each time he picks them out. So what is the advantage of doing this? Well, it's pretty easy to implement, okay? You're just pulling random n numbers out of a hat or generating them in some way. The disadvantage, um, it may or may not be representative of the population. And that's the big thing. You don't really know whether it represents your population or not. It might, it might not. You, you're, you're just pulling these things out randomly, okay? So next up here is systematic random sampling. Okay. So this is when you are usually trying to predict, to choose a specific percentage of the population. You know you want to survey about 10% of the population, so that means you're going to survey 1 in 10 people. Okay. So you enumerate the population or give them all a number, and you take every whatever, 10th member or something like that. So an example here is we've got a row of houses that we want to survey. We choose a random starting point here and we are surveying every, well we do the, f the one at our starting point here and then we do one, two, and then the third one. And then we skip two more and we do the third one. So we're surveying every third member of our population here, so about 33% of the population. 
So this is very similar to simple random. Okay. Um, again, it's easy to implement. Again, the disadvantage may or may not be representative of the population. Okay. So now we move into methods that are a little bit more complicated. Next up is what is called stratified sampling. Okay. This is where you take your population and you break it up into different groups. And then from each of these groups, you are taking a sample which is proportional to how big that group is relative to the entire population. So in our picture here, we've divided our uh, population up into, it looks like, three groups here. We've got um, what look like men, what look like women, and men who are on fire or something like that. And we've got these three groups. They are all equally re uh, represented in our population, so we're going to take one from each of these groups and survey them. Okay. Now, or you could say, um, another way to think of it is your population is divided up into men and women. We have twice as many men as we do women in there, if we ignore the fact that some of them are on fire and some of them are not. And um, we take, so we, in our sample, we take two men and we take one woman. The proportion of things that we sample has to be the same as their proportion um, in the overall population. So an advantage here. This is more representative of the population. Okay, We're getting uh, two men are two-thirds of our population, so they're two-thirds of our sample. It does require more information at the beginning. You have to know something about your population in order to set up your sample, which you don't always have. And as well, it requires a little bit more planning to get this initial information and make use of it when you're setting up your sample. Next up is what is called clustered random sampling. Okay. Where you take your population and you organize it into groups, then sample everyone within a subset of these groups. And this is closely related to what we're going to call multi-stage random sampling. So We've got a picture down here. Um, let's, we can use this picture to illustrate cluster sampling. We've got a population, which are all the people in our picture here, and we've divided them into groups. They're divided into groups by what street they live on. We've got first Ave, second Ave, we've got third Ave. So in a cluster sample, you would take a subset of those three groups you might choose one of those groups and you would sample everybody inside this group. So you would ask everybody here on 3rd Ave to be part of your survey. Okay, so the clustering is kind of done automatically by the population itself and you survey everybody inside one of those clusters. Multi-stage random sampling, you do something very similar. You organize the population into groups but then you sample a random subset within a random subset of these groups. So you might say, okay, I've got my population divided into these three clusters here by what street they live on. I'm going to pick two of these clusters and I'm going to sample a certain number of the population from these two clusters. So I might choose, you know, two people randomly from this one and two people randomly from this one and that would be your survey. Okay. So this is a form of clustered sampling. It's just a little bit more complicated form. Okay. So the advantage here is that this is, again, a little bit more representative of the population. Okay. But again, you need more information to start with. You need a lot more planning to, to implement this. Okay. And then I've added in a few here which you see often, but aren't really all that great. Okay, Here's the first one, voluntary response. Um, any member of the population is invited to participate in the survey. You just sort of say, hey, do you want to do a survey? If, if they say yes, good. If they say no, they don't. Or you say, hey, does anybody have an opinion about this? And they just shout them out. Some advantages of this. Um, it's pretty easy to do. There's absolutely no planning involved. You just sort of show up. Um, and it's often entertaining. You know, you just you think, think of a radio call-in show where they just sort of say, oh, we're talking about this today. Call in if you want to voice your opinion. And people do. 
Okay. The disadvantage is the results are, I shouldn't say always biased, they're almost always biased because only the people who feel really strongly or have enough time on their hands or, or something are the ones who are going to take the, the time and the effort to respond. So you can't really trust your results all that much from a statistical standpoint. Next up, what is called convenience sampling, uh, where your sample is selected simply because it's really easy to select that particular sample. So we've got another picture here involving um, Bob. Bob has a question that he wants to ask, um, and he's basically asking the people who happen to be standing next to him. These other people over here are standing a little bit further away. He'd have to walk over there to talk to them, and that's too much work for Bob, so he's just asking the people who happen to be standing close to him. Um, advantage of this, it's super, super easy. That's the definition that you're only surveying the people who are easy. Um, the disadvantage is, again, it's not representative. Okay. So this is often used um, in places where you don't really want statistically significant results. You just want to get an idea of what some people think, and it usually has sort of a preliminary to doing some more detailed planning for a more detailed survey. Um, and finally, what is called destructive sampling. Okay, um, And you can do destructive sampling using any of these other techniques that we've talked about. The big difference is, is that you just don't, the thing that you pick out to be sampled cannot be put back into your population. So a good example of this is when you're doing um, product testing. You want to calculate the average life of a light bulb. You take a light bulb off the assembly line, you, you, you plug it in, you turn it on, you wait and see how long it's going to last. When it's finally done, uh, you can't put it back on the assembly line and put it in a box. It's, it's, it's done with. You've, you've destroyed it. So um, you'll sometimes see this again in, in product testing. So those are the basic types of techniques for choosing a sample. Um, let's apply them a little bit here. So based on this, what type of sample do you think would be appropriate for each of the following situations? You want to do a survey of engineers, technicians, and managers that are employed by a company. So what sort of sampling technique do you think you would use in order to do this? What do you think, Cal? Why do you say it? Why multi-stage random? Okay, so you're, you've got them divided into groups. You want to ask some of the people in, in, in these subsets. Um, but you want to make sure that you do somebody from each of these subsets, right? Like you don't want to just survey the engineers and the technicians. You want to make sure you also get the managers. So, sorry? Um, let's say there's too many of them to do a census, okay? Stratified is probably what I would think of. Okay, because you've got them divided into groups, but you don't want to ignore any of these groups like you would in any of the, the, the cluster sampling. Okay. Um, let's say you want to determine the most popular pizza topping. What kind of survey is appropriate here? Any thoughts? Sorry? Voluntary? Possibly. Okay, maybe you hang out at the pi at the pizza place and you you know just have a checklist. People click off um, what are their favorite topics, uh, favorite topic. Any other, any other ones that might be appropriate? Do you think? Clustered random. Clustered random. How would you set up your clustered random sample? Okay, so clustered random in the sense that um, your clusters are going to be different pizza locations, right? So the people who go to each one sort of have divided themselves into these clusters, and then you're just going to choose a random sample at each one, okay? That would work as well, okay? Um, another one that you might do is um, systematic random. 
let's say you hang out at the pizza place and you just add every ask every fifth person who comes in to get a pizza uh, what they like. Okay, so you've got sort of a lot a lot of choices here depending on how much time and effort you want to put into it. It could be that if you're doing it all by yourself. Um, you don't want to hang out at a bunch of different pizza locations, so you wouldn't do a clustered one. But if you've got a bunch of people that you're working with, you have more resources to devote, so you could uh, you could probably do a little bit better job. Okay, what about measuring customer satisfaction for a department store? Yeah. Ask everybody who comes into the department store ever. Yeah, your population would be too big. Okay, because you're, you want your population under study is all of the customers at the store always. Okay, so you're not going to be able to ask absolutely everybody. So you've got to take a sample here. Okay, okay. voluntary would probably be what I would say. You, there, there's really no way that you can force people at your department store to fill in your survey. Um, and trying to do so is probably going to alienate them and they're not going to want to come back to your department store. Um, and their card and your, their customer satisfaction is actually going to decrease by you trying to do this. So you really want, voluntary is pretty much the only way you can do it. Even if you want to do something like a convenience sample, um, it's still got to be voluntary whether they're going to answer your questions or not. So in situations like this, you've, you've really, you don't have a lot of options. Okay, you're not going to get great data, but um, again, you don't have a lot of options. Okay, let's try D here. Getting the opinion of Westmount students on changes to the carryover process. However, you have time to visit only six classes and you can only have time to process 30 surveys. So you could, in theory, you know, do a census, but you don't have the time. You've got uh, some stringent um, restrictions here on your available time and effort. Um, possibly stratified. You would have them, okay, I'll say stratified. I was thinking of something a little bit different. Okay, very similar to stratified. Yeah, I was thinking multi-stage random. In the sense that you could say stratified in the sense that you're going to divide people into grades, grade 9, 10, 11, 12, and then do a subset of each of those, okay, from, from each of those grades, okay, making sure you hit all of the grades. I was thinking multi-stage random because uh, you, you divide them into clusters being the individual classrooms. You choose a subset of the classrooms to go into, and then in each of the classrooms, you might only choose five people from each class to sample. So you choose six classes, five people to survey, which gets you your 30 surveys, um, which is all you really have time for. Okay. And that's it for sampling techniques.